Go to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Give me an amen when you're all there. I'm going to just do the introduction, actually. Um, so coming to church, sometimes we need to remind ourselves of, of what really matters. Uh, so much can be going on in the local church with all the activities we're doing, all the programs that we're trying to build up, all the ministries that we're serving in, uh, and so much that can be happening in our day-to-day -day lives between, between Sunday and midweek service and us having jobs and families and all these things that are important. I'm not going to say they're not important. You know, working, living in California, rent's not cheap. A lot of you are working 60, 80, 100 hours a week. A lot of you are, are, are working in overtime. And uh, it's hard to keep your heads on straight because of that. It's hard to keep track of what really matters when so much is going on. But I want you to understand something that really matters. Something that really matters is, is souls. Souls. That's what matters. Okay? Uh, a career, a good living, that, that's nice. But it's not eternal. What is eternal? is your soul and the souls that live here where we're at the location that we're that the Lord stationed us there are souls on their way to hell and eternal hell they're never gonna get out there are people that you probably know that you've loved and you've cared for that are in hell right now and they're gonna be in hell tomorrow and the day after and forever and ever and you know what souls matter evangelism is important and I'm you I'm, I'm preaching this message as a, as a way to just remind us what's important Evangelism. What is evangelism? Do you know? Evangelism, uh, it, it means winning souls. It means telling people about the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so what is an evangelist? What is an evangelist? An evangelist is someone that, that wins souls to Jesus Christ. That's what, that's what an evangelist does. And let me tell you something. Ephesians chapter 4, an evangelist is actually a point, is, an, is a position. It's a position appointed for, by God. Okay, an evangelist is a position point appointed by God. The Bible says in first in Ephesians chapter four verse eleven, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. God, he sent, he sent these these people. He sent you. Apostles, he sent you prophets, he sent you evangelists, he sent you pastors as much as you wish he didn't. He sent you pastors and he sent you teachers. These are all things that, that you should have. God sent them to you. If you don't have a pastor, if you don't have a, an evangelist, there's something wrong with that picture. Someone's not holding up their end of the bargain. And an evangelist is an, appoint, an appointed position from God. But can I tell you something? You might not have the gift of evangelism. Meaning, you might not have very good success winning souls, but you're expected to do the work of an evangelist. You're expected to, you might not be an evangelist, but you're expected to evangelize. Understand? How can, why can I say that? Because the Bible said in Mark 16, verse 15, don't turn with me, but the Bible says the great commission is this. And he said unto them, Jesus, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Who is he talking to? He's not just talking to the apostles there. He's not just talking to the pastor. He's not just talking to the preacher. He's talking to everyone. Go ye. You know what the word ye means in the Bible? A lot of people think that the King James Bible is hard to understand. You can A, a fifth grader can understand the Bible. Ye means you all. Ye is y'all. If you're from the south, that's a little bit easier to grasp for you. But ye is y'all. Jesus is saying, hey, all of you, everyone, go and preach the gospel. And what is the gospel? What is the gospel? The gospel is the good news. Those, those are good tidings. The gospel is found in 1 Corinthians. Turn with me. I want you to have this highlighted in your Bible if you can. 1 Corinthians 15. This is one of the most important passages of Scripture for your evangelism efforts. 1 Corinthians 15. Verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you, the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ, count them, died for our sins, 
according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures the gospel is the death burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ that is the gospel that is the gospel so if you're going to be an evangelist you have to obviously know the gospel that's how we're saved by believing that Jesus Christ is God that he died buried and rose again you want to go to heaven believe on that you want to go to hell do anything else Amen. all right so the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 5, But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, and make full proof of thy ministry. Make full proof of thy ministry. You want to see a man who's serving God? Look, at who's, look who's winning souls. Look who's winning souls without compromising. All right? Billy Graham don't count. That guy was a compromiser. That guy fell away. That guy started kissing the Pope's ring. See, God's not going to look at someone that's going to compromise to win souls. To God, the ends don't justify the means. That's not how God works. God wants to see how pure you're going to do it. He wants to see if you're willing to endure afflictions. See, it's right there. Endure afflictions. Do the work of the evangelist and make full proof of thy ministry. The problem is there's a lot of preachers and pastors and teachers that want to do the work of an evangelist, but they don't want to endure the affliction of standing on the right doctrine. Yeah. See? They, they want to say that, that, listen, you can find God how you want to find God. You can serve God how you want to serve. No. You only serve God the way He tells you to serve Him. See? So, <clears throat> needless to say, we all should be a little bit smarter and wiser in how to evangelize. I, I've met Christians, and they're sincere in their efforts, and they, they don't have the gift. Okay, there's a gift of evangelism, but everyone can evangelize. Okay, don't feel down if you if you just don't see that many people uh, getting saved in your ministry. You can still evangelize. You can still preach the gospel. Okay, and I I've met Christians that they they hand out tracts every day of their life. They try and serve and do the best that they can. Where you can go to the Book of Acts. You're going to be there in just a minute. But I, I've met Christians that that just they're not closers. They're not closers, okay? There's a, it's a sales term. You always be closing, see? Always be close. And some people, they're great closers, and some people, they're great sowers. They sow the seed. See, and God uses any Christian that wants to serve him and, and spread the gospel, he'll use you, see? But I, I would wager to say everyone here could learn a little bit more about evangelizing. Why? Because souls matter. Amen. Souls matter. Uh you should care about souls. You should have a burden for souls in your heart. Uh, it was once said by Charles Haddon Spurgeon, Charles Spurgeon, the Prince of Preachers, if I were utterly selfish and had no care for anything but my own happiness, I would choose, if I might, under God, to be a soul winner. For never did I know perfect, overflowing, unutterable happiness of the purest and ennobling order till I first heard of one who had sought and found the Savior through my means." If you were to be a selfish person, you would want to be a soul winner. Being a soul winner pays. Being a soul winner pays dividends. You're going to be so happy for the souls that you were able to witness to. And listen, we're not, we should be soul winners, but don't get it twisted. Don't get confused. You're not the one winning the souls. Christ is the one winning the souls. You're more like a soul warner. All right, that's what Pastor Peter always tells me. Um, you're soul warning. And yeah, you, we do win souls. Amen. We're soul winning church. Pastor Peter would always tell me that God would put the angels on half on half rations to support to support a soul winning church. Okay, uh, so we should have a burden for souls. Now, I want to introduce you to someone today. There's many people in the Bible that you should know about. There's many characters, and these are all people that 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 lived here once. These are people that, if you're saved, a lot of these people are people you're going to meet in heaven. And one of the people I want to bring to your attention is Philip. Philip, okay? Philip, if you'll turn with me, go to Acts chapter 21. I want you to introduce, I want to introduce you to Philip. Philip. Now, Philip was one of the 12 apostles. He was one of the 12 apostles chosen by Jesus during his ministry. And Philip, he was known as an evangelist, as an evangelist. And Acts chapter 21, verse 8, the Bible said, or says, and the next day, we that were of Paul's company departed and came unto Caesarea, and we entered into the house of Philip, the evangelist, which was one of the seven, and abode with him. Philip, 
He's the only person in the Bible that is called an evangelist. So we want, if we want to evangelize, we better look at Philip and his life. Let's see what kind of man this guy was. Go to John. Go to the book of John. That's in the New Testament. The book of John, chapter 1. John 1. You give me an amen when you're there. John 1. If you, do you need help? Can you help your sister? You got it? Okay. John 1. <laughs> Dividers or, or, or uh, thumb indexes are always useful. All right. So John 1, chapter 40. I'm sorry. Chapter 1, verse 44. We're going to read about Philip. Now Philip was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip findeth Nathanael. I'm sorry. We'll start at verse 30, 43. The day following, Jesus would go forth into Galilee and findeth Philip and saith unto him, Follow me. So right off the bat, we're introduced to Philip. And this guy, Jesus said, Follow him. Follow me. So Philip, he, he's a person called by Christ. An evangelist is someone who has been called by Christ. Now Philip was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip findeth Nathanael and saith unto him, We have found of whom Moses and the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And, Na and Nathanael said unto him, Can there be any good thing that come out of Nazareth? Philip saith unto him, Come and see. So, an evangelist is someone who tells another person about Jesus. And he just doesn't stop there. He, he tries to bring them in. He tries to bring them to church. An evangelist is someone who tries to bring someone to Christ. You know where you're most likely to find Christ? Is going to a church and being preached to. And getting the gospel preached to you. An evangelist is someone who, who, who is in the effort of bringing souls to Christ. See? Christ said, follow him. And you know what? He did that. And he went above and beyond. You know, most Christians won't bring another person to church. Most Christians are ashamed of being a Christian. Most Christians, they won't make the effort to say, hey, do you want to come to church today? Hey, we're going to have a, a potluck today. If you want to eat, you should come to church. See, an evangelist is someone that, that will, will reach out. And Philip had this in spades. Philip was an apostle chosen by Christ, and he brought more sheep into the fold. You know, the Bible is, if you go to, don't turn with me there, but Genesis, God is talking in Genesis 1 about all the animals. They bring they bring forth after their own kind. Uh, a, an animal, a, a dog, is going to breed another dog. A cow is going to bring a breed another cow. Sheep should bring sheep, breed sheep. See, if you're a sheep, we're all sheep if we're Christian. If you're a sheep, you should be breeding more sheep. You should be bringing more sheep into the body of Christ. See, um, pastors are supposed to be breeding more pastors. We're supposed to be training people to serve the Lord to the past in the pastor position. If if I'm a pastor, now. Yeah, a pastor is supposed to bring more sheep in the fold, but you as sheep, you're the ones that are supposed to be bringing more people in the body of Christ. You're the ones that are, you're tasked with the responsibility. Remember, the Great Commission is not to just pastors. It's not to just preachers. It's to everyone. Okay? So, I, I wanted to introduce you to Philip because he is an evangelist. He is the evangelist in the Bible. Now, go with me to Roman, or Acts. Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. And we're going to get to our main text. Our main text. See, we're using the Bible. Amen? Amen. We're going through it. So Acts chapter 8, verse 4. And I'm going to read all the way to verse 8. Therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake hearing and seeing the miracles which he did, for unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with, with palsies, and that were lame were healed. And there, and there was great joy in that city. And there was great joy in that city. So, Philip, he made foolproof of his ministry. He was down there. I, will bring your, I want to bring your attention to that verse right there. Philip went down. Philip went down. He didn't go up. He went down to where the sinners were. He, did, he went down to preach the gospel to people that, that needed the gospel. Christ, he didn't come to save the righteous. He came to save sinners. He came to save sinners. So, Philip, he went down 
And you're gonna have if you're gonna be an evangelist, you're gonna have to go into some areas where you're not you're not welcome. You're not you're a fish out of water in some spark parts of the city. Okay? If if all we did as Christians were was hang out with each other and spend time and sing kumbaya and and make each other feel good without going out and doing the work of an evangelist, we're not doing Christ's will. A Christian is supposed to be out evangelizing. Okay? And he was making full proof of his ministry. He went down to the Samaritans. So, real quick lesson for you. Samaria was known as a, as a, as a place full of half-breeds. Okay? They were half Gentile, half Jewish. Half Gentile and half Jewish. So, that's important. That's important. Why? Because you're going to see that a lot of miracles in the book of Acts are being performed. Now, do Christians perform miracles today? Question. Can a Christian go out and heal a leper? No. But you know what? That wasn't always the case. There was a time where God, he gave, gave the apostles and these Jews, Jews, the ability to perform miracles, to drink poison and not die, to heal, raise someone from the dead. And these are all signs, miracles, and wonders. And the signs, miracles, and wonders are for Jews. They're not for Gentiles. Remember, the Bible says in the book of Romans, I believe, or the, no, the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, that the Jews require signs and the Greeks seek after wisdom. Okay, if you want to win a Jew, if, uh, God, if God wanted to win the Jews over right now, he'd be using Christians to perform miracles and wonders. In the book of Acts, there is a transitional phase where God is still trying to reach out to the Jews. Okay, the Jews, they crucified Jesus the Messiah, but God was still trying to give them the kingdom. To give them the kingdom. So to do that, he gave the apostles the gift of tongues, the gift of signs, miracles, and wonders. And these are all physical. Physical. Okay? For the express intent of winning Jews. Winning Jews. But why do you think there's no miracles anymore? Because God's done with the Jews for now. He set them aside. Put them on a shelf. I'll be back. I'm going to go focus on the Gentiles who seek after wisdom. That's why he doesn't use physical gifts and wonders and miracles anymore. Why? Because... They're for the Jews. So I need to bring that to your attention because charismatics and Catholics and a lot of wrong doctrine is, is permeated through these, uh, these, her these wrong doctrine churches that, oh, we, we have the gift of the Holy Ghost. I can go out and, and blah, 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 speak, speak in tongues. And all they're doing is sounding like, like, like they're high, like they're, like they're doing – like that doesn't sound Christian. I, if I – I went to a charismatic church before I found a Bible-believing church, and I wanted to leave as soon as I started seeing all that garbage going on. Amen. All right, and that's what it is. You know how much that put—that's what pushes people away. Not the, uh, you know, you should preach more on love. No, you know what pushes people away from getting saved is—is is the wrong doctrine, is the people thinking that that they have the spiritual gift. That oh, I'm so spiritual because I I have the gift of tongues. Uh -huh. You know, ch charismatics—they have a pride issue about that. They think well. Don't worry. One day you'll be as spiritual as me when you start speaking in tongues. Don't worry. You're just not really saved. You know they believe that? They believe that if you don't get baptized and start speaking in tongues right out the, right out the toilet water, then you're not really saved. They do that. See? But we're done with that. We're not, we, walk, we walk by faith, not by sight. Understood? Capiche? Capiche. So, Acts chapter 8, verse 9 to 13 One second. Acts chapter 8, verses 9 to 13. But there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out them, giving out that himself was some great one. So this guy, Simon, he 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 was a somebody, so to speak, in Samaria. He used a lot of false uh, sorcery, he used a lot of wickedness. Uh, to essentially to fool the people into thinking he was some great great person like wow that's Simon that guy he healed he healed me he used this hocus pocus magic and now I and now I, I don't think I feel that ache in my back anymore <laughs> you know he he was a he was, he was a charlatan okay and verse ten to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest saying the man is the great this man is the great power of God. And to him they had regard because of that, because that of long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. You got to be careful for the people out there that carry themselves as some somebody, and they're out there doing uh, palm reading. They're, you want me to do your horoscope? 
Do you want me to uh, give you your angel number? See, they, they do all sorts of uh, sorceries and, and, and esoteric means of trying to enchant you, trying to get you convinced that there's somebody. Verse 12, but when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized both men and women. Okay. So Philip, then Philip comes into the picture. They're so used to this guy, Simon, that when the real deal Philip comes into town, man, they're taken away. This guy, he's doing actual miracles. He's doing actual signs and wonders. He's showing these, these half Jews that he has the power of God, not this guy, Simon. Okay, but then Simon himself believed also when he was and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. So then that's weird. So Philip. So this guy, Simon, he got saved. Okay, well, let's see what he does with the gift of salvation. Now, when the apostles, which were at Jerusalem, heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. Remember I was telling you that the Holy Ghost came upon the Jews and they were gifted with all these signs, miracles, and wonders? So these people were saved, but the apostles, they came down and prayed that these half-Jews might receive these gifts, these ability to perform miracles and wonders, which illustrates to you an important concept, that, that once a person is saved, once an evangelical effort is, 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 is being strived for, the work doesn't stop there. Okay, when souls are saved, you don't just boom, you leave town and on to the next, you know, on to the next place. No, you're expected to give them the, what they need to start to serve the Lord. You, when you witness to a soul, when you save someone, you don't just say, you're saved. Congratulations. All right, now go do whatever you want. No, you don't do that. You, you, you are expected as someone who has begotten another person in Christ. You know, they're, you're their spirit. You're technically their spiritual mother, not like. Not to the extent where you have authority over them, but you, you, you've begotten someone as a spiritual father or spiritual mother in Christ. Listen, when I give someone the gospel, I'm expected to give them the means and the, and the knowledge they need. Hey, listen, now that you're saved, you're not supposed to live like them anymore. Now that you're saved, you're, you, some things are expected of you. Okay, You're supposed to go to church. Church is not optional. Hebrews 10.25 is clear on that. You're supposed to tell other people about Jesus Christ. You're supposed to read the Bible every day. You're supposed to pray. Every, there's some things that you should know about. You know you're supposed to get baptized once you're saved? Oh, more on that later. I'm sorry. I'm getting ahead of myself. So, where was I? So, the, event, the, the efforts didn't stop there. Uh, Acts chapter 8. Sorry, the wind keeps blowing my page away. Verse 16. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them. Only they were only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. See, so there's a there's a different baptism. There, you know there's seven baptisms in the Bible? And for sake of time, I'll only tell you that in the book of Acts, you're going to see two, uh, two different baptisms. You're going to see the baptism of the Jews for the rece receiving the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, for the signs, miracles, and wonders. And you're going to see the baptism uh, of the Gentiles. Remember, one baptism is be repent be, be be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Okay? That's the Jewish baptism to receive the Holy Ghost. We're baptized, us Christians today are baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. They're different baptisms. They're not the same. Okay? So, verse 17. Then laid they their hands on them and they received the Holy Ghost. And when Simon saw that through the laying uh, through laying on of the apostles hands the Holy Ghost was given he offered them money saying give me also this power that on whomsoever I lay hands he may receive the Holy Ghost but Peter said unto him they thy money perish with thee because thou hast thought the gift of God may be purchased with money thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter for thy heart is not right in the sight of God repent therefore of this thy wickedness and pray God if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee for I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Then answered Simon and said, Pray ye to the Lord for me, that none of those, these things which ye have spoken come upon me. So Simon is an opportunist. He sees an opportunity to make money. He, he's a Christian that has dollar signs in his eyes. He's a guy like Creflo Dollar. He's a guy like Joel Osteen. He's a guy like... like um, I forget uh, Benny Hinn. He's someone like Joyce Myers. All they see is dollar signs when they see these gifts. 
Why do you think so many churches say that they have the gift of tongues? Because there's money in it. If it doesn't make sense, there's a buck in it. Amen? So, Simon was one of these kinds. And, and what did he... By the way, he's treated as if he's saved. He said, you better pray to God that he'll forgive you because you're, try, you're trying to buy the gift of God. You're trying to buy your way uh, into, in, into people's good graces. Yeah. See? Look at, look at this church. Do, do we have money? <laughs> you have the Lutheran church down the street on 9th. On ninth. Man, those guys, they have... Man, but are they serving God? Are they preaching the death barrel? They might be preaching the death barrel. They might be doing, you know... All right, they're doing. They're not. They're not as wicked as say, you know, the, the Mormon Church or. or but you, are they? Are they on right doctrine? Are they doing it biblically? No. See, and I'm making this distinction not to show you that look, we're so look how good we are. I'm trying to get you to realize that if you want to serve God, you have to do it the way the Bible teaches, not the way man teaches. Okay, if you're not in the Bible, how are you going to know that these guys are crooks? See, how are you going to know that Simon? The, the guy, the, the Christian with dollar signs in his eyes isn't trying to get a buck out of you. See, we go that, I bet, I bet you, all right, I'm not going to, I'm not going to bet, but I'd wager to say that probably some of these people that have gone to, you know, nursing homes have asked for money. See, we don't ever do that. It's not about the money. It's about serving God. Amen. It's about doing his will. So, one second. His heart was carnal, and his heart was not right with God. And I, I want to ask you to reflect. Ask yourself, is my heart right with God right now? Am I doing everything a Christian should be doing? Am I preaching the gospel? Am I teaching the gospel? Am I doing what a Christian is expected to be doing? Am I going to church? Am I studying to show myself approved unto God? And don't come to me. I'm not the God police. I'm not here to, I'm not here to say, did you read your Bible today? I'm not here to tell I'm not here to do that. I'm only here to preach the word. I'm the pizza delivery boy. It's up to you if you want to eat it or not. Amen. So I'm gonna stop right here. Okay, I could go on, but I want to make this a two-parter because evangel evangelism is, is, a, is important. Praise the Lord that there's a, a sound doctrine here, sound doctrine church here that wants to preach the truth and and, and, and tell people about Jesus Christ. But I want to I want to make you I want to give you a decision to make. Am I going to tell people? Am I going to give people the gospel despite how it's going to make me look? Am I willing to just hang up my pride and say, listen, we're all sinners. We're all wicked. We all deserve a hellfire. But God has given you an opportunity to witness to someone. And if you want to know how to evangelize, I recommend you keep coming to a Bible-believing church, a Baptist church that, that stands on the King James Bible. And... Uh, if you don't know the gospel, if you don't know how to witness to someone, it's very simple. It's very simple. I always ask this. If you were to die today, are you 100%, not 99%, not 98%, 100% sure that you would go to heaven? Nine times out of ten, a person will say, well, I don't know. Catholics call it the sin of presumption. Oh, you, don't, you can't know you're saved. First John, First John. I take you here every week. I want you, if you if you have a, a good tattoo parlor near your place, have the tattoo artist tattoo this behind your eyelids. I'm just kidding. Don't do that. <laughs> but this is important. You can know. You don't have to have a question or doubt about it. First John, chapter five, verse thirteen. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. Such a critical verse that most people just gloss over. They don't think about, uh, I'm, I'm sure, I'm eternally secure. I know where I'm going. So when you ask a person, are they 100% sure? That's your opportunity to give them that assurance because odds are they're not sure. And you take them to that verse. Listen, you can know. You don't have to have a doubt about it. And this is how you can know. Then you take them to 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 to 4. Listen, you have to believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Are you a sinner? Usually they'll say, yeah. Because the Bible says, I'll take you down Romans Road. The Bible says in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I don't care how good you are. I don't, I don't care how much you go to church. I don't, care how much, I don't care how many souls you win. You're still a sinner. I was over there teaching uh, at the nursing home. Listen, we're not sinners because we sin. We sin because we're sinners. 
And the Bible says in verse 10, as it is written, there's none righteous. No, not one. See, too many people are trying to make it to heaven by being a good person. Too many people are trying to make it to heaven by anything but Jesus Christ's righteousness. Remember I said, you want to go to heaven? Believe on the righteousness of Jesus Christ. You want to go to hell? Believe on anything else. So, how do you receive this gift? The gift. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So go to Romans 10. This is, this is, I'm walking you down Romans Road. That's what evangelists call it. And you, you can go back online, watch this service, and see how, how an evangelist or a preacher does it. Because evangelism is actually very simple. All you need to do is be uh, prayed up. All you need to be, do, uh, be doing is put your nose in that Bible and go to a Bible-believing church, and you'll be guided and instructed in righteousness. So Romans chapter 10, verse 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's how easy it is. You, you have any idea how many people I, I, I've asked if they want to call upon the name of the Lord and they're not willing to? It's the easiest thing in the world and people still don't want it. Um, a lot of people think that, well, if you just changed your approach, if you just did it differently the way I think, then, then people would be more likely to accept. And that's not how it works. Amen. If it was that, it's the easiest you can possibly make it. Okay. It's the easiest God could possibly make it, and people still reject it. Why? Because they, because of pride. Because they think their righteousness is good enough. That's what does it. A person that chooses not to be saved, odds are it's because they're too proud. Because they don't want to admit to God that they're a sinner. And if you want to be saved right now, you have to call upon his name. You can't just assume, well, I believe. Listen, the devil believes. The devil believes. What makes you different from him? The fact is that you're trusting on Christ. You're trusting on Christ. And if you want to be saved right now, if you're watching online, this is how you get saved. You just bow your head and come to the Lord honestly and sincerely with your heart and with your mouth and say, God, my Father, I'm a sinner. I believe because of my sin, I must be condemned to a burning hell. But Lord, I believe on your Son, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, that he died, buried, and rose for my sins. And Lord, I'm asking you now, the best way I know how, Lord, I forsake my own righteousness and believe on the righteousness of Jesus Christ for my salvation, that he bled for my sins and covered them with his blood. And I ask you now with all the sincerity of my heart, in Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you do that sincerely, honestly, with your heart, you're saved. And you have assurance of salvation, you can know where you're going. So the next time someone comes up to you and asks, are you 100% sure if you are to die today, you'd go to heaven? You can say honestly and sincerely, yes because I believed on the death, burial, and resurrection. Not my works, not anything else but Jesus Christ. With that being said, let's bow our heads and ask the Lord to dismiss us now with his blessing. In Jesus' name, Lord, I ask you. Uh, and I thank you, Father, for just coming down and being with us, Lord. And I pray that this, this message could have been a blessing to the hearers, Lord, that you could have just guided whoever was listening, guided their hearts, Lord, to, to just do a little bit more for you, to do the work of an evangelist, Lord, to serve you like Philip served you, Father, to bring them in. And Lord, we're, we're just a bunch of wicked sinners, Lord, but we're just so thankful that you've given us the opportunity to do something that makes a difference in eternity, Lord. And I pray, Father, that all those that are on their way to hell, that you give them another chance, that you give them an, an, another opportunity to receive the salvation that only comes by the death, burial, and resurrection. Lord, dismiss us now with your blessing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Can you turn off the stream, sister?